So today uh, we're continuing on with our investigation of different application areas of artificial intelligence. Today's focus area is going to be vision. For a very long time, computer scientists have been interested in finding objects and images. You may recall that on the first day of the course, I referred to a story when I was uh, much younger and I visited the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab in 1968 and learned from them that the most difficult part of getting the robot arm to stack the blocks was the, the video part where the TV system had to figure out where the blocks were and how big they were so it could position them on the table. They had found a method that would locate the blocks that only worked with three identical blocks and would not work with four or more and would not work with uh, blocks of different sizes. You may also recall that I mentioned the story of a professor at Carnegie Mellon called Louis Fanon, who in the early 2000s invented a two-player game to accelerate the process of labeling images in the Google database. Well, about 10 years later, Google had programs that label images and there was no longer a need for any human to get involved in that process. There was no longer a need for people to play games to label images. And also, in the same time frame, services like iPhone and, and Facebook found ways to identify pages, faces in the photos that are stored on them and label them if they match your contact list. So what happened in this intervening time, just it seems like less than 10 years, uh, what happened was a technology that's called convolutional ne neural networks was perfected and greatly accelerated graphics processing chips called GPUs or graphics processing chips were found to be extremely effective at accelerating these things. This technology, although it started in the 1980s, really accelerated in the last few years. And in fact, image recognition has been a holy grail search that has actually pushed the development of neural networks. So today's speaker is uh, Professor Matthias Kolsch, who will speak to you on this topic of vision and what's, what's how it's progressed and what's all the great things that are happening. He's a member of the computer science department here at NPS and he's also a member of MOVES. He came to NPS in 2005 and started a vision laboratory in the MOVES area. His students had many accomplishments, but one of the ones that always impressed me was the one where he showed that he had algorithms that would look at images in real time and find weapons that were being carried by people in the image. He took three years of leave to join uh, an AI company uh, dealing with augmented reality and is now in the process of returning to NPS to teach again beginning in the winter quarter. So I welcome Matthias Kolsch and ask you to welcome him too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, thank you uh, for introducing me and thank you for welcoming me back here. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have such a fantastic audience. That doesn't always happen to have such a full house. Um, do you know why you're here? Why is there such interest in AI? So I don't mean this in an existential sense, right? Why are you here? But, but why all this interest in artificial intelligence? After all, it's a pretty old discipline. It's been around 50 years or something and uh, most people lost interest, I guess, in the 70s when no humanoid robots were walking amongst us, and they, they still don't, right? Uh, so why, why this sudden interest in artificial intelligence? Sudden, really, the last five years, probably four years. Um, as Peter said, there has been a, a very strong, renewed interest in, in the discipline. So what I'm here for is to tell you a little bit about that and a little bit about what computer vision is. Um, who has heard of computer vision before and kind of knows what that is? Can I get a show of hands? Oh, okay, now I really feel like I need to talk to you because computer vision is not only a, an important discipline, it's also an amazing, uh, fun, 
fascinating discipline, and I hope you'll walk away from here having gotten a glimpse at what it is and sort of how it works. Obviously, I can't you know, give you an in-depth introduction to the discipline in 30 minutes, but um, I hopefully will spark a little bit of interest. Um, and I feel particularly, um, it feels particularly necessary uh, for me to, you, to present computer vision to you because I feel it kick-started the revolution in AI that we've seen over the last five years or so. This is debatable, of course, but um, I will try to make a point um, that certain aspects about computer vision um, lend themselves to artificial intelligence and by nature of that, actually, I will try to explain what some of the current limitations are of uh, what these neural networks or AI can do these days. So let's see. Um, here's an example of a computer vision method that currently works very well. It's in the medical image domain. This is a convolutional neural network. And it can answer questions as to whether there's a wrist fra fracture here and where it is. So if you were an orthopedic uh, MD, you might be able to tell easily whether there is a fracture. I looked at this for quite a while now, and I, I have no idea. Did, oh, you can tell that there is one? Yeah. OK. So <laughs> I, <laughs> is that where you placed it? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know what? I would have needed you about 20 years ago, because I actually had a wrist fracture that went undetected for about a year or something before somebody finally said, all right, let's take another look at this here. So I would have really liked either you or the artificial intelligence here. Or best of, best of all, both of those. Because um, that's another big point I'm trying to make during this talk, that computer vision is great, AI is great, but it's not so great that we trust it all the time yet. Right? This is a long road we have to go. In some ways, we are more trustful, and in others, uh, less so. For example, for a medical device to uh, gain regulatory approval, um, AI has to jump through a lot of hoops, and it's not particularly good at that. So there are failure cases. I think you've heard about some of those uh, in this class already. Um, and those are very important. So uh, they need to be considered. So here, um, this is from a 2018 paper. So it's already old, right? Because we're moving so fast with this. Um, the human by itself was only able to um, accurately identify that there's a fracture with about 81%. Um, in a large data set, whereas a uh, computer with the help of highlighting where the fracture might be, um, they achieved over 90% sensitivity here. So this is a big improvement. Um, and this is only one of the many examples where computer vision, and in particular these deep neural networks, currently really excel. Um, let's see. Um, so what is computer vision? You sort of know what it is. Let me give you a little bit more specificity to that. So taking any data as input that has more or less a two-dimensional shape, like a matrix, or sometimes even a three-dimensional shape as images that are coming from a LiDAR device, um, processing that and producing some output that is mostly not in the image domain. So there's one example where I drew a box around that AK-47 here. That is almost an exception. Computer vision is more concerned with producing something other than an image as output, right? For example, yes, there is an AK-47 right here in the image. Or, yes, there are characters in the image, optical character recognition, this is what the text says. Or counting people. There were 49 people that walked through this gate in the last seven minutes. Or recon this is a 3D model or doing 3D reconstruction. That is something that is essential to doing robot navigation for doing augmented reality, for doing a lot of other disciplines um, or techniques, and computer vision is at the heart of that. Um, the panoramic image that you might be able to take with a smartphone has computer vision underneath. So there's a lot of different applications um, that computer vision is kind of behind the scenes in on. And um, let me see if I can point with this. Oh, look, I can. So there's also non um, visible light imagery, so for example, sonar imagery that you might take underwater. Um, there are images on the web or that you might capture with a 360 camera. So all of this kind of input gets processed um, and turned into this output of the sort that I was mentioning. 
The, the steps in between, I want to focus on a little bit um, just to give you a sense for what this is about and to better explain what these uh, neural networks actually do and why they're so amazing. So the first step generally is to extract some features. A feature is a terrible word. It's a very overloaded term. What do I mean? I mean things like bright points in the image. I mean edges, little circles, little shapes, little color variations, small little things that I can describe in the image whether it's a texture or appearance, it could also be motion over time, a change over time. Um, we extract those with a first kind of pre-processing step. And once you've done that, you say, well, there are you know, corners here and here and here in the image. And instead of now taking the 2D image as input to the next step, you take the here and here and here of where these 2D corners are and how big they are, how they're oriented, um, and stick them into this, this feature space, right? So instead of having an image, you now have this what we call a feature space. And now you apply a fairly standard um, classification um, methods to figure out if there is a certain pattern in here, in this feature space, or if you can classify into, yes, these features over here, they hint at a face being in the image, or they hint at a pedestrian walking into the street or something of, the, of that nature, versus no, they don't. So we do a classification. Classification is a way of learning because you're learning what's called a decision boundary between all the features that are in the you know, yes realm and all the features that correspond to images in the, in the no realm. Um, so arguably for the longest time for, you know, decades that computer vision researchers were working on this, there was a, a strong focus on extracting features. Um, before I go there uh, quickly, um, you might have heard of computer vision by other names such as image understanding or machine vision. They're all related. That's almost um, the, the same discipline. Uh, depending on from what field you might be coming, you call it one, way, one thing or the other. Um, it's all more or less the same. So, um, more focus on, I keep pressing the wrong button here, more, more focus on these, these features. Um, they uh, progressed over the decades. And there was a bit of a tug of war in a way between features that were becoming smarter and smarter and more and more complicated, um, more able to describe things in the image that was what's called invariant to certain modifications, invariant to the brightness, for example, right? I take two photos of the same scene and I overexpose now, underexpose one. Well, the individual features are going to look very different. Your face is going to be very bright or very dark, depending on how I expose this. Or, you know, the, the background, people in the background here, they might be, uh, you know, very crisp and clear, depending on my focus or not. Um, if I can describe these image features in a way that is invariant to those changes, then my classification algorithm later on doesn't have to worry about those changes anymore. So that's a good thing, right? I reduce the complexity of the image and I have a simpler classification problem. The other reason why we have these, uh, why we extract these features is because of mere computational complexity. An image can get large. I mean, even a small image of 100 by 100 pixels it's 10,000 pixels times three um, color channels. So you have, you know, a good amount of data that you might want to do, might have to, to process later on. And these days, you know, the uh, images are 12 megapixels, so you can see how this explodes pretty quickly. So the goal here was computational reduction, um, making these features invariant to certain changes. And I'll give you an example of a feature descriptor that was the most popular feature descriptor for almost a decade. Uh, it was published in 2004. I think variants of that were around a little bit before. Um, it turned, changed its name depending on who implemented that. But this SIFT detect, uh, image descriptor, uh, again, was the state of the art for a very long time. And I'm showing you here to explain how complicated this thing is. It's, it stands for Scale Invariant Feature Transform. Um, and you apply this template, this, uh, uh, yeah, this template to any spot in the image. And you calculate uh, in the neighborhood around that spot where you applied it, 
you calculate here, for example, what the dominant gradient is. What is the dominant edge direction in there? And you calculate a bunch of numbers. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers that you calculate, basically the length of each of these arrows. You do that for here, 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 here. So you end up with, I think, a 60, or a typical number is 64 um, locations in the image and descriptors, um, you, where is it, 128? You end up with a bunch of numbers. So you end up in a 128 dimensional feature space where you then do the classification. And you move this thing around and it's very powerful. It's very good. And this guy, David Lowe, I don't want to, to diss him here at all, right? He's a brilliant researcher. And again, he came up with a, a very useful thing. But he put basically his life's work into coming up with this feature descriptor. So lots of thought. And um, as you saw, the, the features evolve over the decades. The more experience the researchers had that came up with them, um, the better they got. And also, the more computational power we had, the better they got. Um, once you have your image described by these numbers that were calculated with this template that you moved across the image here, we did more or less the same thing. We did classification, learning off a decision boundary between, you know, those are AK-47 images, those don't have any AK-47s in them. So standard thing. And now we try to learn what this thing looks like, right? So instead of just learning the decision boundary, now we thought, well, why do we need these smart people figuring out what this descriptor looks like? Why can't we just let the computer try and figure out what this descriptor looks like? And people have tried that for probably three decades, I think. So since I think the 90s at least, they were working on neural networks. Um, and this is what a neural network looks like. Again, wrong button. Um, you have an input layer. Have you seen neural networks here? Yes, right. So you get an input layer, which is basically the image. This image has exactly three pixels, so it's not a very pretty picture. Um, there's a bunch of hidden layers, and there's an output layer. Often the output layer says, again, AK-47, yes, no. Um, this is what's called a fully connected network. Right? Every input node is collected to every output node. Three pixels isn't very cool, so how about a few more? Um, this image has eight pixels, still not a good pixel uh, image. Uh, fully connected network for a 12 megapixel image, you can't even draw that anymore. Right? There's so many connections. But what is the power of that? The power of this is that we say this, this uh, network has all the abilities to express basically any function, anything that can be learned from an image could be somewhere in there. And we've known this for a very long time, but the challenge was it was computationally completely infeasible to, to calculate this. Um, <clears throat> so, let me see where I'm at here. These deep neural networks, they do, do this magic. They learn what a feature descriptor looks like. We don't need David Lowe anymore to come up with a, with a SIF descriptor. We don't need all these other researchers anymore. Now we can ask a computer to do it. But again, there's hundreds of millions of parameters in these networks. And if you know anything about um, optimization or um, optimization problems, this is what's called uh, under constraint optimization problem. Basically, you have many more variables than you have um, equations or knowns to solve for these unknowns. So you can make this work in a bazillion different ways, but only some of them might work and many don't. And actually, a lot of that hasn't changed. So we've learned, we've gotten better at training these things, but um, we still, um, it's still a non-deterministic training procedure, meaning random inputs. Let's see where it goes. Maybe this one works. The one that, yes, that we trained yesterday didn't work. Well, what about the one today? So there is still this random non-deterministic aspect in there. Um, and there's a technique actually called ensemble networks where you just train a whole bunch of them and you combine them together and hope that the sum of the individual ones that does better than the individual network that you've trained. So there's a number, there's a bit of magic in there. So magic really has two meanings, right? So one, this thing can learn anything, but two, it's like uh, kind of magic to get it to do what you want it to do. And so now we're coming back to uh, computer vision. 
In computer vision, we use a thing called a convolutional deep neural network. A convolution is a beautiful term for constraining the network down to a more limited operation. So instead of having these fully connected networks, we now have limited connections between the layers. So basically, we're getting rid of a number of the unknowns, a number of the parameters, because we exploit some properties that are inherent in the image. So, so listen up here, right? Um, these deep neural networks that work so well for these medical images, they work partially so well because we're looking at images and not looking at other types of data. Right? If you're looking at stock data, there, there, there might be stuff in there that also works. It's a time series. Uh, but if you're looking at uh, completely random data, you're looking at text and you're learning from text, these things don't work quite as well. You have to change quite a bit around to make them work. So why do they work so well? Because we can apply these localized um, filters that is called a convolution, and we can reduce that incredible um, complexity from that many parameters down to a smaller number. Um, so what's shown here is how an in input image, imagine that network, but flip right side up here. Um, so this is your input layer to the neural network. This is the next layer, uh, next layer, last layer. Um, and what you see here is that these features that get calculated um, in the learning, in the training of a, of a deep neural network become more and more object-like. Um, down here, they're color splotches. They're lines, you know, there's a diagonal darkish line. There's a bunch of horizontal lines next to each other. So these are the features that this network responds to. And why the, again, why these convolutional neural networks work well is because that same pattern could occur anywhere in the image. Anywhere. And that's an operation that the image processing community has long worked with, has perfected. There's hardware that can compute this. Um, so computer vision, again, is at an advantage when it um, wants to apply these neural networks um, for their tasks. So the other neat thing here is um, it's compositional in the sense that uh, once I've detected a wheel, let's say, or something that looks like a wheel, this could be anywhere in the image, and multiple of these things that I've detected actually give me a stronger indication that there is a bicycle, a car, or something else with you know, two or more wheels, which is ultimately what I'm looking for here. Um, so these layers nicely build on top of each other, not only in a mathematical sense, but also in a very, um, um, you know, in, in a very semantic fashion. It makes sense to me, um, as I'm trying to des describe a car bottom up, um, that I would compose it out of these uh, individual, individual parts. Um, here's another example. Um, this is from, well, can you guess what this neural network was for? Digits, yeah. Um, and actually that was one of the first successes for neural networks. Um, they actually have been around in computer vision for quite a while, as Peter was uh, um, alluding to. And one of the first commercial or production applications was to recognize zip codes. In, on letters. So as the letters flew through the automatic sorting machines, um, a neural network would try to detect the, uh, the zip code where it's written and also identify the, uh, the digits, the individual digits, and, um, well, sort it based on that. So this was, a, yeah, note the date here. This is 2009, but this was actually an application already in the, I think in the late 90s is, is when that started uh, to be applied. Um, so two examples. What you're seeing here, by the way, is, um, I forgot to mention that explicitly, this is the first layer, the first hidden layer in, in the neural network. Again, the, the features are fairly primitive, just dark and white splotches, maybe some curvature, you know, there's a curvature here, there's a straight line there. This is the second hidden layer. Um, you can start to make out some more connected uh, features that resemble a, a digit. And then finally, in the last and third layer of this neural network, um, you can really see some digits. This almost looks like an eight. This looks a bit like a four. 
and so on. Um, what was considered a deep network back then wouldn't be considered a deep network today anymore. So three layers is, is not that deep anymore. Now we have deep networks of 20 or more layers, actually. And what else is in these layers? Um, it's actually a bit of a mystery. And one point I want to make with this slide is that we're trying to learn what the neural network learns. Um, there's a real research direction dedicated to trying to figure out what these things do, how they work, why they work in the first place. Um, and, you know, to, to some degree we can explain this, why it works, and we can show a bunch of um, formulas why it works, and we can show that it works, but if I have to explain why this heavily, it's still a heavily under constrained optimization problem. When I have to explain why, why exactly that comes up with this, or even worse, when I have to explain why a certain image was classified as this but not that, that's when we're still um, struggling with good answers. I think a term that you um, have heard there before is uh, fragility, I believe, or, and also tamper resistance of a neural network. Um, there's a common example of a stop sign with a bunch of stickers on it that suddenly doesn't get recognized as a stop sign anymore. So explaining those failure cases is really hard. All right, back to this uh, somewhat psychedelic slide here. Um, how did this come about? So uh, this came about by looking at one of the layers. Again, there are 20 layers or something now. So we picked, let's say, layer fairly high up, 17, for example. Um, and we say, I want to visualize what's in this layer. So you can visualize a bunch of numbers in a grid and it doesn't look like much. Um, you know, it doesn't look like a car or uh, an animal or something. So what they came up with is a way to um, generate images from that middle layer. We pump random data in, so not an actual image. We let it propagate through all of the 17 layers and then we stop and we look at which neurons actually fired in there, in that neural network at that layer. And then we amplify that response. And we go backwards and we try to generate an image from, from that because uh, we have forwards, backwards algorithms anyway that go through this network forwards and backwards. So we, um, we generate basically an image going backwards to the usual direction and we do what's called um, amplification of these neurons. Um, this has also connections to what's called reinforcement learning um, where we, we think we've learned something and we, we amplify some early evidence for something that we've learned and we test afterwards if you actually did learn something new or not. So this is what it comes up with, right? This is what it thinks it learned at layer, say, 17. Um, and what you can see in there is some pretty big scale features, right? So there's a real face here, um, or there's some sort of a tower, or whatever this is. And if I zoom in a little bit, um, you also see a number of small scale features. So you see something that looks a bit like a snout, or it could just be something natural in the image. Generally, light comes from above, so things are generally lighter at the top versus at the bottom. Um, and little repetitive things. So you sort of get an understanding for what's in these layers. It's still hard, right? I, I stick other random data in and something completely different comes back out. Is this useful? Um, it, it helps explain what's in the layers, right? And, and that's ultimately uh, what we're after, getting a glimpse into what this neural network actually learned. That handshake is in the wrong place, um, but uh, <laughs> it was supposed to be here. So again, I want to come back to my hypothesis here um, that computer vision really catalyzed the uh, 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 recent research and, and interest for artificial intelligence and in particular for these deep neural networks. Um, I explained why these convolutions are important because they reduce the feature space tremendously and I can actually learn. Um, a big one is also that in computer vision we have uh, very, uh, um, we have ready availability of increasingly difficult problems at hand. Digits, recognizing digits, arguably is fairly straightforward. 
uh, detecting faces is a little harder because they can be oriented always, you know, lit all kinds of different ways. Um, doing an identification, a recognition of a particular face is even harder. So there are these, you know, fairly straightforward progressions into more and more complex problems. So we could challenge our researchers with an increasingly uh, difficult problem set. Um, so that actually really helped um, propel the, the science forward or easily track it along. Nowadays what computer vision or these deep neural networks can do is stunning, right? I showed you some medical examples, but it can also, for example, identify bird species. And honestly, I look at two images of two birds and it, it's like, you know, find two differences. Not 10, no, no, just find two differences between these and I cannot pick it out, right? And so th there are some, what are they called, ornithologists? They can really tell the species apart and they say, oh, you know, uh, you know the hair over here behind the ear is a little longer, or the feathers are a little bit, you know, in the other direction. The deep learning networks can figure this out now. It, it blows, blows me away. <coughs> Another big reason why this came about and uh, that I think is an important one for us to keep in mind as we are um, at an institution that is trying to bring academia to the government, to, to the military, um, because industry and academia collaborated really closely, really tightly. Um, the main breakthroughs there came in 2013, 2014, 2015, when Google, Facebook, Stanford, Berkeley, and a bunch of other academic places just traded data and, and people and sent them to internships and then the data flowed back because there was so much data that Google had that was annotated, right? Um, we could use that as training data. And you've probably heard that for training these deep neural networks, you generally need tons of data, hundreds of thousands, millions of images with labels. If you don't have that, if you only have a thousand, that's a non-starter. I tried to label a thousand images manually or 10,000 or 100,000 and say, you know, there's something in the image. Have you come across these CAPTCHAs that now ask you to say, where is there a traffic light in the image? Now, after two or three of those, I'm like, <laughs> 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 So labeling, uh, you know, a million is completely out of the question. Um, how am I doing on time? Do I have a minute to rant? I think I have a minute to rant. So, um, I think we're at a danger with artificial intelligence um, to fall even further behind um, in the military because we don't have ready access to what the industry has access to. I've seen this with computer vision, right? Computer vision in the 2000s, it was still an academic discipline. You couldn't make any money with it. And suddenly industry realized, hey, there's some money in it. And they started running with it. And they're running really fast. And the problem is other nations don't have those constraints, uh, uh, at least not all of them. And they're running fast because they have easy access to the latest and greatest in, in AI. And so we have to really be cognizant of that. And I'm, I'm so glad to see you all here because I hope you realize a little bit of that danger as well. And you're trying to make a difference and trying to change that a little bit. So this is good. Um, lastly, uh, GPU, graphics processing unit capabilities, um, they map really well to deep neural networks. It's the same kind of data, the same kind of processing, um, you know, single precision floating point in a grid. Uh, that's exactly what you do for graphics. That's exactly what you do in a neural network. So we had the computational power to do this finally. And that's why they did so well. That's why they came about um, and, and are able to accomplish what they can today. Here's another couple examples um, of medical image analysis. Um, this is a um, mass calculation on mammograms um, in x-ray images. This one um, identifies uh, lesions in the brain, brain MRI. This one, so the, the highlights here, right, that, that's what the neural network does. Here it actually calculates the mass, so it tells you, I don't know, 50 milligrams or something like that, uh, or some. Um, here it highlights places in the lung tissue where there are leaks. Um, some diseases uh, have 
that, that, that occurs in some, some diseases. Here, the neural network highlights these little plots in the retinal image, in the retina, um, where there is a diabetic disease. I'm not an MD, I don't know the details of this, but um, this is scar tissue, I think, that you can identify if you look very closely. And so a human could also do this, but they would have to sift through this image very in you know, a very detailed fashion, whereas the computer vision algorithm can just run over it and very qu quickly highlight where there's scar tissue. And then the amount of that scar tissue and the locations of that will, they, they drive the diagnosis and the treatment that uh, can be done. And not, yeah. um, if you get these slides afterwards, there's a couple more images and a text box that explains a bit more. I'm not going to go into this. <coughs> so another couple, a few applications here. Um, Self-driving cars. So the left here is a, what I think, beautiful image of a truly self-driving car concept study. Um, and it almost disappears, right? This is the steering wheel. Um, because, well, ideally you don't need it anymore in a self-driving car. Um, and the company that is probably the furthest towards the goal of a self-driving car is Tesla. Um, I find them impressive due to their vertical integration. Um, you know, not only do they sell a consumer product, a car, but also do they build their own chips. They started selling their own chips, well, not selling, cars. They're selling cars with their own chips. Um, Earlier this year, uh, it's purpose-built for self-driving. So the input is from eight cameras, 12 ultrasonic sensors, and a radar, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and it makes its way into a custom chip, which has two hardware neural networks. Um, it has a 12-core CPU, so very parallel processing. I'm a computer scientist, so this stuff gets me excited, right, for a number of reasons. Um, I don't have a 12-core CPU in my laptop, um, so that's cool. There's also a graphics processing unit in it. But really what's super exciting is that we have hardware for doing neural network processing now. Um, and other companies have done this before as well. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, there, there's a bunch of companies that now have spe uh, uh, dedicated hardware to running neural networks because they know it's so important. Um, on your smartphone are, I think, not fully hardware neural networks yet, but there is circuitry dedicated to running neural networks, although it's not, anyway, um, details here. Um, what, again, what amazes me here is that um, uh, the neural network is such an integral aspect of self-driving cars that a company decides to craft their own <laughs> chips from it. I mean, that is going really deep, right? This is, this is you, you couldn't have done this 10 years ago. This is uh, un unheard of. Apple, you know, didn't, Apple and chips is a different story. Um, uh, I had another point here. Right, so um, about five years or so, um, I learned that the most successful self-driving cars almost don't rely at all on GPS or on LiDAR data. LiDAR is a 3D technology, right, where you get 3D information. They do almost everything in the 2D image. Yes, ultrasound, yes, radar, um, but no 3D data. The only GPS they use is to figure out when the car kind of wakes up, am I still in the same spot? Am I still in the same city, sort of, or the same suburb? And from then on, it takes a bunch of images, matches those against the database, from the images calculates the 3D stereo uh, depth. It does everything based on computer vision. So that really amazed me. Um, Let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I just have the, this and one more slide. What I want you to take away from here, again, is that um, computer vision and the current research in AI are kind of intricately tied together. Computer vision outperforms humans in these specific tasks. Um, it really does better than somebody with 20 years of experience. And when that first research came out that showed 
you know, we're doing better. We can do, I think it was cancerous uh, cell detection as well. Uh, it, it blew people away, right? Um, and this is just the beginning of where computer vision makes its inroads there. This is not necessarily a threat to people that have this expertise because, again, as I showed on the very second slide, the human working with the computer is ever so much more powerful than just the AI system by itself. There would be no self-driving cars without computer vision. Um, what we're still struggling with is a lot of the explainability. Why did this come out this way? The predictability. Um, will this algorithm that you sold me today to do, uh, you know, detect AK-47s actually work in the field when I go deploy somewhere? It's tough. Um, the reason is the training data set and the data set that you're running the algorithm on might not be the same. Um, if that, so I, I should have probably made that a bit more, more explicit, but all these algorithms are trained on a data set, right? The millions of images that came from, from industry, for example. Uh, well, if the test set or the actual application set in the end doesn't match that data set, all bets are off. I cannot predict how well this is going to perform. The networks are not robust in that sense. And that's where some of the main limitations are. Um, so is what we have actually artificial intelligence? You know, what I showed you today, is that a hint of artificial intelligence? Who says yes? Wow. A half a hand. Um, so who says definitely no? Are you still awake? Definitely no intelligence? Who's asleep? No. <laughs> no, so what else do you say then? I mean, if it's, it's got to be yes or no, right? I mean, is, is this a hint of artificial intelligence? Yes or no? Is there something in the middle? Should I ask again? So is this a bit of artificial intelligence? All right, okay, so that's 10 hands. Well, it's debatable. I, I don't know, right? So first of all, somebody's got to define AI. And you know, if you ask three people, you're going to get three definitions for what is artificial intelligence. What I've shown you here is actually, I think, fairly straightforward um, to explain what it does. It, it, it learns correlations, right? It, um, artificial intelligence would, I would think, allow us to do some causal reasoning. This because of that. But it doesn't do this here, right? This just says, oh yeah, this looks like, I've, like something that I've seen before and it was called a car, so I'm gonna call this a car too. Actually, the computer vision algorithm has no idea what a car is. You know, if you, if you told the algorithm then, what's closer to a car? A, um, a dog or a bicycle? You know, I'll, I'll ask my kids and they'll give me an answer, no problem. In fact, I show them a sketch of something that they've never seen before and they can extrapolate from there. They do computer vision algorithms and AI, the, the deep learning algorithms, they mostly do interpolation, right? Between data points, they can kind of string a line, but they can't really very well extrapolate beyond those known data points. So there are limits. Peter, how much time? Am I good? Um, one of the prominent computer vision, actually AI researchers, uh, Judea Pearl, um, he was a, a very strong, successful researcher. And lately in the last few years, he's turned the corner and he's saying, you guys, you know, you're still doing the same stuff we were doing 50 years ago. Now let's look beyond that. Now let's do some of the real AI. So look up um, Judea Pearl if you, if you want to learn more about this. Um, the second bullet here, I can't emphasize this enough. This is where, again, you can come in very uh, strongly in making a difference. Um, you need to understand what the AI can do and what it cannot do and where, you, where a human can help it out to be better. Human, machine, collaborative systems, they're going to win the battles of the next decade, I wanna say. It's not one or the other, it's both together. So, I'll stop here, thank you so much.